Now that we've examined the force a magnetic field exerts on a moving charge, and at the magnetic fields created by electric currents, I'd like to explore the force exerted by a magnetic field on an electric current. Recall that the force on a moving charge was QV cross B, a cross product of the charge times velocity and the magnetic field. Well here, we'll imagine a current which has a number of charges moving in the same direction. If we can imagine a length L of wire that contains some moving charge Q, so this means a charge density of Q over L, so so many coulombs per meter that are moving with a speed V. So in some time delta T, the charges are going to move a distance delta X, which is V delta T. The current is the amount of charge passing across a point in unit time. The amount of charge delta Q is the fraction of the total charge that travels the distance delta X, or the amount of charge that resides in a distance delta X. This is going to be delta X times the charge density Q over L. So the current, which is delta Q over delta T, just divide the last quantity here by delta T, and that gives us QV over L. So our vector QV from the Lorentz force formula can be replaced by IL. Those are the same quantity. So for the force on a wire, QV equals IL. So the force, which is QV cross B, we can just say is IL cross B. Notice here what I've done is I've not made the current I a vector, I've made the length of wire L through which it travels a vector. I, a scalar, times L a vector gives you a vector which is the same vector as charge Q times velocity V. This is a hanging wire apparatus. I have this swinging wire, uh, which is connected to two electrical leads, uh, po which are connected respectively to the positive and negative terminals of the power source. Right now they're not actually connected because there's a momentary switch here. When I push the button, then the circuit will be completed, but right now the circuit is not completed. The magnetic field around this section of the wire goes from north to south, so the magnetic field is oriented down. If I press the momentary switch, you see that the hanging wire, the swinging wire, is propelled out. If I reverse the polarity, then when I complete the circuit, the swinging wire is pulled the opposite direction into the magnet. If I reverse the direction of the magnetic field, when I close the circuit, the force pushes the swinging wire out. Now I have a question for you. If we have two wires that are parallel and carrying currents in the same direction, how are they going to affect each other? I give you three choices. I'll eventually tell you the answer. It turns out they are going to have an effect on each other. One wire creates a magnetic field. A magnetic field exerts a force on a current in a wire, unless that current happens to be along the direction of the magnetic field. But that's not going to happen. A single wire has a magnetic field that's tangentially around it, which is always perpendicular to the direction that the current flows in the wire. If we have another wire that has current flowing parallel to the current in the first wire, the magnetic field created by the current in the first wire is not going to be parallel to the current in the second wire. Here's how I can figure out what this is going to do. Here I imagine two parallel conductors carrying currents I1 on the left and I2 on the right. They're going to be separated by some distance r. We can use the right-hand rule to tell us the direction of the field created by the wire on the left. Point the thumb of your right hand in the direction of that current, and the fingers of your right hand are going to curl around in the direction of that magnetic field. So that magnetic field is going to be like this. On the left side of the wire, the magnetic field is going to be coming out of the screen toward you. On the right side of the wire, the magnetic field is going to be going into the screen away from you. It's also the case that the magnetic field strength gets weaker as you get farther away from the wire. Remember, that's a 1 over R dependency. At any rate, at the location of the wire on the right, the wire that's carrying current I2, the magnetic field is into the screen perpendicular to the direction of the current. The force on that wire carrying current I2 is going to be in the direction of IL cross B. IL, point your fingers 
in the direction up, and then B, curl them so that they go into the screen. Extend the thumb of your right hand, and you'll see that it's pointing to the left, toward the other wire, toward wire one. And that, in the end, means that it's going to be attracted by wire one. You can do exactly the same analysis for the force on wire one from the magnetic field created by wire two, and you'll get a force to the right. So these two wires are going to attract each other. Parallel currents attract each other. You can use exactly the same kind of analysis to realize that anti-parallel currents are going to repel each other. This was the origin of the definition of ampere that was valid until about a year ago. The definitions of some of the basic SI units was changed, and the fundamental electric unit is now the Coulomb, which is based on the elementary charge. Before about April of 2019, the ampere was the fundamental SI unit for electricity, and the Coulomb was defined in terms of the ampere. And here's how the ampere was defined. If you have two parallel wires held one meter apart, and you have a current of one ampere going through each wire, then the attractive force between these two wires is going to be 2 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons for each meter of length of the wires. This requires mu naught to have the value that it does. Now that this is no longer the definition of an ampere, mu naught has a measured value rather than a defined value. Now that we've talked about the force exerted by a magnetic field on a wire carrying an electric current, let's talk about what happens when the wire is in a loop. What's going to happen, of course, is one part of the loop is going to carry a current in one direction, and the other part of the loop is going to carry a current in the opposite direction. These forces are going to be on the net completely canceling each other. This might not exert a net force on the wire, but it still could exert a net torque. So let's imagine that this circuit of wire is a parallelogram of any shape. So why a parallelogram? Because we have opposite sides that are parallel to each other and of equal length. So we can put a parallelogram in any orientation. Here I've got a magnetic field illustrated by these X's. So this means that it's a magnetic field, uniform magnetic field, pointing into the screen away from you. This green parallelogram represents a conducting loop bearing an electric current. We can define some measures for this parallelogram. Vector L will be one of the dimensions, the length, and then vector W, the width. The force exerted on one side of the parallelogram is going to be exactly opposite the force exerted on the opposite side if the field is uniform. So this force is going to be the opposite of this force. This force is going to be the opposite of this force. So the opposite forces cancel, but the torques, it turns out, don't. It's a straightforward but tedious exercise to calculate what the torques are going to be from this. So it took me about a page of vector algebra, again, tedious but straightforward, to come up with this formula. That the torque on a loop that has sides defined by vectors L and W is going to be I, the current going around the loop, times the vector L cross W, so that's a cross product, that's a vector, cross the magnetic field B. So this is a triple cross product, a cross product of three vectors, L cross W cross B. This itself is going to be a vector, which is good because torque is a vector. Interestingly, the magnitude of L cross W gives you the area of the loop. That vector, L cross W, we can characterize as the area vector of the loop. What an area vector is, it's a vector that is normal to a surface whose magnitude is equal to the area of that surface. So that particular shape, that parallelogram, has an area vector of L cross W. It's often very convenient to use the quantity known as the dipole moment, or the magnetic dipole, of the loop. This magnetic dipole, which is given the symbol mu, not to be confused with mu naught, is the current going around the loop times A, the area of the loop. And this is defined in terms of the area vector. It's the magnitude of the area vector of the loop. If you have a more complicated shape um, that might be you know, not in the same plane, something like that, you can still, it's still meaningful to talk about what the area vector is. It's just more complicated to calculate it. The magnitude is given by I times the area vector. The direction 
of the loop dipole moment is given by the right hand rule. To find that direction, you simply curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction that the current is flowing around the loop, and the extended thumb of your right hand will point in the direction of the loop dipole moment. So for an example, if we have this current, um, which is showing looking down from above, a current is going clockwise. So if you curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction of that current, you'll see that the dipole moment mu is pointing downward. In this other example, it's a little more difficult to see exactly what in two dimensions, but if you curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction that this current is flowing, then you'll see that the loop dipole moment is diagonally up to the right and back a little bit. Recall that the formula for torque was I times L cross W cross B. So I times the area vector times the magnetic field vector. I times the area vector is the magnetic dipole moment of the loop. So torque is mu, vector mu, cross B. Note that because of the nature of the cross product, when mu and B are parallel or anti-parallel, the torque will be zero, and the torque will be maximal when U is perpendicular to B. So the torque, it turns out, is always going to push the loop, to torque the loop, in the direction of aligning it with the field B. So qualitatively, the magnetic field is going to try to orient the current loop so that the magnetic dipole moment of the loop is pointing in the same direction as the magnetic field B, which is exactly what happens when you put a dipole magnet in a magnetic field, is the magnetic field torques the magnet so that it aligns with the field, like a compass needle, for instance. Well, the reason is because it is a dipole magnet. Now, as I mentioned, if mu is anti-parallel to B, there's also no torque on it. So what does that say about the magnetic field trying to orient the magnetic dipole to be in line with the field? Well, if it's anti-parallel, there's no torque right in that orientation, but it's an unstable equilibrium. If it deviates just a little bit from being anti-parallel, then it'll flip it to be parallel. A parallel alignment is a stable equilibrium a deviation pushes you back to the equilibrium position. If it's an unstable equilibrium, what's essentially happening is that the Laplace forces on the individual sections of the loop are all pushing it inward. And if they exactly cancel, that's great, but if they don't exactly cancel, then that'll immediately torque the loop and flip it. When the magnetic dipole of the loop and the magnetic field are parallel to each other, this is a stable equilibrium. If you work out what's going on with the individual segments of the loop, they're all being pushed outward. And you see that if you have a small deviation with that, an outward force on all the segments will tend to pull it back to the equilibrium position instead of pushing it far away from this unstable equilibrium.